Um, yeah, so thank you for the for the warm welcome and the introduction, Anas. Um, so you already said that I'm an associate professor at the University of Copenhagen and head of the new NLP section. Um, in addition, I've recently started um, a role at CheckStep um, where I co-lead the research um, division. And um, Jonathan will tell you a little bit more about what we do at CheckStep later on. So here in this presentation, I'll focus on my, on my research um, at the University of Copenhagen. Um, so this first talk will be about fact checking and in that context, um, explainable fact checking. Uh, first, I'll tell you a little bit about what fact checking is and why we need it. And then I'll do the same thing for explainable AI. And then I'll present some of the initial uh, solutions we've developed for explainable fact checking. And then I'll wrap up afterwards. Because the audience is very mixed, I won't go into deep technical details here, but I have another uh, talk online that you can watch later on if you want with some more technical details about these methods. All right, so uh, first, what, what is fact checking and why do we need it? Well, the reason we need it is that there are many different types of false information online. Um, so one example here from, uh, co from Corona times um, is uh, there was a lot of false information that, that's being spread about Corona. So one is about how Corona can be cured using bleach or alcohol. Um, then about how Corona um, is spreading. Um, and um, those, those things are very, very harmful to public health. Then it can also sometimes happen that journalists make mistakes uh, due to not, not careful enough uh, proofreading or insufficient research. And one example is here about a Brazilian politician who was said to enjoy his free time reading Toy Story, uh, watching Toy Story, but actually he um, enjoys spending his free time reading Tolstoy. Um, so these things sometimes happen and then uh, newspapers have to correct them. Another example of a type of false information is clickbait. And clickbait means to overpromise in, uh, over promise information and under deliver it. And it's been it's become very, very popular. Uh, so popular, in fact, that there are clickbait generators out there where you can just enter a keyword and it will give you a clickbaity headline. Um, I particularly like the last one here, 11 ways investing in fact checking can make you a millionaire, which 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 has some some truth to it. So, yeah. Then I'm, I'm sure you're also aware of these satirical websites like um, The Onion or Rokoko Post that make up full stories just for satirical purposes. So this one here says that Mars is um, implementing a, a travel ban after um, they found a, a very a, a British um, a virus uh, variant. So um, this is of course it's, it's of course false, but it's still close enough to the truth <laughs> that, that uh, people might struggle with it or machine learning models. Right. And another example are websites which have a very strong political agenda and publish some very skewed articles like this one saying birth control makes women unattractive and crazy. So it's a description of some scientific articles about the you know, the downsides of birth control, but they went completely over the top in describing the, the, the side effects. All right, so to sum up here, um, there are many different types of false information out there. The first one is disinformation, which means that information is uh, spread intentionally um, and is, um, is false. Uh, then there is misinformation, which means the information is false, but it's unintentional. So this example I mentioned about the journalists getting something wrong and then having to correct it. Then there is clickbait, which means to exaggerate information and under deliver it. Then there is um, satire. And there is a biased reporting, which is to report only some of the facts to serve an agenda. And when it comes to fact checking, we typically look at these two uh, things, disinformation and misinformation. Um, there are also approaches to clickbait detection, satire detection, and biased uh, detection of uh, biased reporting, but that's not what we typically refer to when, um, when we say uh, fact checking. So how does fact checking work? Um, how, can, how can one do fact checking automatically at a very, very uh, high level? Um, 
so here is how one can think of a, um, a full fact checking pipeline. So the first thing is that some kind of statement is given, like immigrants are a drain on the economy. And then one has to determine if this, if this um, statement is check worthy or not check worthy. And there are different things that go into this decision. So one is, is it even something that's a fact or is it an opinion? And the other thing is, should it need to be fact checked or would people believe it without fact checking? And also, is it interesting to fact check it in this particular context? So if you think like a, of a statement like bananas are either yellow or green, that's something everyone knows. It's just world knowledge. No one would, want, would need to fact check that. Another example is when we think of political debates, then the statements which, which are likely to be check worthy are things related to the, to the person's political manifesto or such, and not, for example, related to where they were born. People wouldn't, wouldn't want to fact check that. So it's, it, it seems like a very simple task because it's just a binary classification task, true or false, but it's actually very complex already. And then building on this complex task of claim check worthiness detection, uh, we have evidence document retrieval, which is something that Maria will tell you a bit more about later on. But it means we have this claim, um, now a check worthy claim, and for this we want to retrieve some information, some evidence, which we will then use to decide if this claim is potentially true or false. And we can use, uh, we can use some search engine for that or some other types of uh, methods. And then Based on this claim and these evidence documents, we want to make a decision of, we want to make several decisions of, do those evidence documents support the claim? Do they deny the claim? Or do they not really provide any useful information about the claim? Right, so here we might have immigrants are a drain on the economy and an evidence document saying EU immigrants have a positive impact on public finances. Um, so that would provide some evidence. And then the last step is um, called veracity prediction, where given all of these all of these partial predictions, all of these individual predictions, um, we want to say if overall this claim is true or is false, or if there is not enough information to make that prediction. So this is how it works overall. And as you can see, there are many different components. And usually one trains, say, one model per component. And one of the reasons this task is so complicated is because if errors are made early on in the pipeline, it's usually not possible to recover from them anymore. Okay, um, so why do we need explainability in this context? Well, one thing I've already told you is that this task is very, very complicated. And so it's important to understand why a prediction is made. When a model is developed, a machine learning model is developed for a specific task like automatic fact checking, then what typically happens is that there is a person called an architect who develops a, a machine learning architecture, some kind of neural network architecture about what happens to the input and how, how does one arrive at the, at the output uh, given the input. And then this is passed on to a trainer, again a person who takes this uh, raw model definition and uh, feed some data into this model um, to learn how, how to actually make predictions um, for a specific domain. And then this model is deployed such that the end user can actually see the predictions. So uh, for example, given a claim, the end user can see is this true or false or is there not enough information? But what the end user doesn't see is what happens inside that model. The end user will only be given the final prediction. And this is because these models are usually very, very complicated. So it's difficult to tell them exactly what happened. Um, but it's something we would really need and, and want. And one reason is that it's important the model doesn't just make the right prediction, but that the model makes the right predictions for the right reasons. An example here is we have a claim in the COVID-19 crisis, only 20% of African-Americans had jobs where they could work from home and evidence saying 20% of black workers said they could work from home in their primary job compared to 30% of white workers. So this evidence sentence um, confirms that claim um, and 
if a model selects this evidence sentence uh, to make a prediction, it makes the right prediction for the right reasons. Um, however, uh, what can also happen is that it makes um, the, the wrong prediction for the right reasons. So um, that can be if the evidence says something um, and the evidence is just wrong, or maybe there is insufficient evidence and the model has just learned to associate certain um, lexical signals with a positive label. So here the evidence, the, the example is children don't seem to be getting the virus and the evidence saying there have been no reported instance of infection in children. Now, based on that, one could infer that um, children don't seem to be getting the virus, but it, it, that, that's not the, the um, conclusion one should draw. Um, now, another example is uh, when a model can make the right prediction for the wrong reasons. So one, one thing that happens very often online is that there are these celebrity death hoaxes. <laughs> so this means that someone reports that a, cele a celebrity has died. Um, and this, this means that, well, that their hoaxes meaning that the celebrities haven't actually died. But if a model often learns to associate that whenever there is a text saying a celebrity has died uh, to predict uh, they haven't actually died, then this leads to, to lots of wrong predictions. Um, and it can, it can lead to um, uh, the right prediction for the wrong reasons or the model making the wrong prediction for the wrong reasons as well, due to overfitting to these spurious patterns. All right. Um, so to now get back to our model development pipeline, if an end user only gets a prediction, they don't know if the model has arrived at this prediction for the right reasons or for the wrong reasons. In addition to, they don't know if it's right or wrong. I mean, they, they, can, they can might be able to tell. So what we would want to do with explainable AI is to say, this end user should also have some way of inspecting the model. So to turn the model from a black box model into some kind of white box or gray box model such that um, they can have a look at what the model has learned and how it's arrived at that prediction. And then the end user can, can say, okay, this model has made the, made the wrong prediction, but for the right reasons or the right prediction for, for the wrong reasons or so on. And then provide some, in, some, some feedback to the person training the model and say, okay, based on this, it's been trained on the wrong data or, or you know, the, something else has gone wrong and then a better model can be developed based on that feedback. All right. Um, so this was a brief introduction to explainability. Now I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we can how we can build explainable fact checking models. And again, I'll do that at a very high level, due to the um, diverse audience. So the first thing one can do is called rationale selection. And what this means is you have some kind of claim, like the Faroe Islands are no longer part of a kingdom, and you have a, a Wikipedia article here with a long entry about the Faroe Islands and then the label should be refutes. And now what the model has to do is it has to look at the right part of this evidence document. So the right type of sentence. And rationale selection means that what is checked is if the model um, um, focused on the right sentence for making that prediction or not. And if the model arrived at the right prediction by also looking at the right sentence, then we assume it's learned something meaningful. And if not, then not. And there is rationale selection for sentences. And there is also rationale selection for words. And this here is an example of natural language inference, which is again, one of the component tasks of fact checking. So here, if the model focuses on, on, on you know, the last part about if the adult is, is holding a stick or not, um, then the model makes the right prediction for the right reasons. If it focuses on dressed versus walking, it doesn't make the right prediction for the right reasons. Okay, um, so what, what is it that's difficult about this? Well, one thing is that it's already very difficult for humans to select which parts the model should focus on. And this is partly because there can be multiple correct explanations for something. There might be multiple sentences from which one can make the inference about the label. And this makes the task very complicated. Um, and another thing is that this leads to such explanation generation models also focusing on different parts of the input. 
So this here is a heat map where we can see what explanation a human would produce for this sentence. So the sentence is, sometimes Twitter makes me feel like an outsider, which should be, um, which, which has a negative sentiment. So the task here is a sentiment um, classification. And the human would focus on outsider or the human who's annotated this data set said outsider is the main reason this is negative. And then some models might focus on this as well, but other models might focus on sometimes um, or, or Twitter or feel. And all, you know, thinking about it, these are all valid things to focus on and which one is really the right one. Um, so this means evaluation of these explainability methods is really complicated. And this is something we've looked at in, in our research. So one way to evaluate them is to say, do they agree with what humans have annotated with human rationales? Uh, but this shouldn't be the only way to annotate or to, to determine if an explainability method is right or not. The other way is to say, um, um, are, these, um, are these explanations important for the model's confidence in a prediction? It's a bit difficult to explain perhaps. <laughs> Um, uh, slightly easier to explain is, is this faithfulness, which means that if a model only has access to the tokens which are, which, which are part of the explanation, can it still make the right prediction or not? Or does it result in a massive drop in performance? And uh, the other way around is if the most important tokens are masked, these ones which are supposedly part of the explanation, then can the model still uh, make the prediction or not? It should result in a drop in performance if it's really a good explanation. Um, then there is rational consistency, uh, which means if two very similar models are trained, they should arrive at the same explanation. And if they don't, then it, you know, the explanation might not have been very good. And then there is data set consistency, which means that very similar instances should have um, very similar explanations. And we've evaluated this for multiple different types of models and all of these different diagnostic properties. And I won't go into the details here, but you can see the results here. So we have, um, what do we have here? We have human agreement, um, we have data set consistency and so on. And then you have an indication of which of these methods over here um, results in, in, in a score, uh, in, in what type of score. And you can see on a very high level that these methods, they perform well with respect to different scores, meaning that they're very different from one another with respect to different diagnostic properties. Um, so that's one of the finding of this research. The other finding is that even though they perform very differently, um, all of them perform better than a random explanation. <laughs> so if we somehow try to aggregate these scores, they all somehow do better than just randomly picking a token and saying, this is the explanation. So that's, that, that's good. Um, and there are many more findings, but you can read the paper if you're, if you're very interested. Okay, so this was it for rationale selection. And the, then the other type of explanation is, is called free text explanations. And what we did there in this study is to say, if we have a, a claim, we want the model to provide an, an actual paragraph of text saying why, uh, what the explanation is. And there is a polit PolitiFact, which is a fact-checking portal where journalists go and they manually annotate uh, claims as being true or false or, or something else like pants on fire. And what they can, what they contain is, uh, what, what's contained there is, uh, for each of the claims, um, there are long ruling comments, uh, which are articles written by journalists summarizing evidence and taking a stance on, on evidence documents, which they also manually identified. And then they come up with a ruling, which is a justification. And we view this justification as an explanation of the overall ruling, which it is reading some of these. So based on this, we can train a model um, which on one hand predicts the veracity if a claim is true or false or something else. And on the other hand, provides a summary of all of the evidence. Um, and this summary is then the explanation. And we don't just want the model to provide any kind of summary independently from the fact-checking process, but we want the model to provide 
this explanation or learn to generate this explanation at the same time as learning to predict a veracity label. And in this way, the model can provide an explanation that's somehow you know, somewhat conditioned on, on this veracity prediction task. All right. And one thing again to keep in mind for this is the evaluation. So because we now have paragraphs and not no longer just sentences or words as explanations, we have to take other things into account like coverage. Does it miss, does it contain all the important information? Non-redundancy, does it repeat any information or not? Non-contradiction, does it contradict itself within this paragraph? Overall, overall explanation quality. And then informativeness, which means can a human predict the veracity label based on this generated explanation alone or not? And can a model do it as well? All right, so that was it in terms of uh, predicting, uh, generating explanations. Now I just have an overall wrap up and overall takeaways. Um, so the first is why do we want explainable AI and explainable fact checking more specifically? Well, it's because we want to understand if a model is right for the right reasons. But also these generated explanations can help users understand one, the inner workings of a model, which is called model understanding, and also how a model arrived at a specific prediction, which is called decision understanding. And in this talk, I only uh, presented methods for decision understanding. Explainability can also enable model in the hub, um, human in the loop model development and human in the loop data selection. Um, there are some caveats. So there can be more than one correct explanation, which is one of the things to pay attention to. Uh, different explainability methods can provide different explanations. And also most work, uh, most work on explainable AI is done on very simple classification tasks for images or texts and not on complicated tasks like fact checking. So there are also different streams of explainability methods which have different benefits and downsides. And I'm, I've not presented so many of them, but I'll, I'll mention this anyway. So one is that they perform well with respect to different diagnostic properties, which I've mentioned. Then they have different requirements regarding how much training data they need, um, uh, so how much training data is required to train stable explainability methods. And then there are a, a number of other ones, like should they be trained jointly with the with the other task or after the models have been, after the main task models have been trained? Do they need to have access to the parameters of the model or not? So are they black box or white box? And then can they only be used for hypothesis testing or can they be used for bottom-up understanding? And then lastly, can they only be used for one-time analysis of errors or can they be used for continuous model training and development? So where do we go from here generally? So one is explanations should be useful to model trainers and also end users. So it's important to understand how to interpret different explanations. One might also want to have a combination of model and decision understanding methods. And also the explanation granularity should be different for different types of users. For example, thinking about content moderation, there you have the end users of the platform, but you also have people doing the moderation um, and they might, might be able to deal with more complicated explanations than end users. And very lastly, there is some research on generating explanations, but there is relatively little work on understanding in what context they are useful and how to really do, do human in the loop development. Um, so that's the, the very final thing. So. Then I want, just want to say thank you for listening and thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, thank you to my PhD students who work on explainability, uh, Peppa and Dustin, and also thank you to my colleagues Jakob and Christina who've been part of this work and thank you to my research group. Um, here are the papers I've mentioned. If you're interested in our work, oops, you can read um, those, those two last papers. <laughs>